So, friends, colleagues, guests, um, I have the pleasure of welcoming you here to Professor Ria Prisker's inaugural lecture. Um, I'm Deborah Johnston, and I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor here at London South Bank. So, I'm going to introduce this lecture, and before I do that, I'm going to um, say something I always say when I give a talk to a large group of people. I have got a stammer, I will get stuck on words, and it will be okay. It will be okay. So before I formally introduce Professor Prisca, I'm going to say a little bit about the nature of an inaugural lecture. So an inaugural lecture, first and foremost, is a celebration. It's a moment to celebrate. And it's a moment where the, where the new professor has an opportunity to formally pre um, present to her peers um, and to demonstrate that contribution that they've made. It's a moment of celebration for the school that the professor is in, and in this case it is the School of Business, because it's a moment in which the school can come together and celebrate the achievements of their, pro of their professor to bring together colleagues and, to, and, um, and possibly former students and to look to the future, to make new connections and have new conversations. And it's a moment of celebration for the university. It's one of these key moments where we can talk about the contribution we make through our research, through our teaching, and we can share that contribution with the wider public. So it's a celebration this evening. Um, for that reason, it is very appropriate that we meet in person. I, and, and I love to say this because it does give a certain gravity and a certain weight to such an important milestone in a, in a professor's career. Um, it also gives me the opportunity, and your hearts will sink, to do that standard introduction to a face-to-face -face meeting. And it is this. Please make sure your mobile phones are switched off. Do tweet. That's lovely. We love that. But please make sure your phones are switched off. Um, the toilets are just outside of the door. They're signposted. Keep in mind we are recording the event this evening um, and there are no plans for a fire alarm test. So if the fire alarm goes off, please make your way either at the back of the room or at the front and follow the signposted exits. So with that out of the way, let me introduce to you um, the work of Professor Ria Prisca. Um, Ria is a professor of human resource management and I asked her to give me a really simple layman's description of her field of study. And she said um, that the best way, the easiest way to describe her field of study is how employees and workers experience their working life and how they can express their voice in the workplace. So I wanted to tell you something about Ria's journey, her journey to the contribution she has made. So Ria was born in Athens, Greece, and after graduating high school, she went on to study a four-year Bachelor of Science in Business Administration, and this was at the American College of, of um, Greece. And she did this while she was working part-time for a small company in Athens. Now, when she was in the final years of her study, she began to discuss the possibility with her parents of going on and going to the to the UK to pursue a master's degree. And at that point, she had the news from her parents that unfortunately it wouldn't be possible. So they shared with her the fact they were, they'd um, supported her brother through four years of study, and they'd supported her through four, through, four, through four years of study. And she was disappointed, but she accepted that, that um, reasoning, but she didn't give up because one of the things she wanted to do was to um, learn about um, master's courses. And so she went online, and she found a list of UK universities, and she went on to order printed copies of the postgraduate pros prospectus for those universities. And we were just talking about the fact this was in the days before you could download everything. This was in the days where you kind of ordered something, and you waited patiently, expectantly, for it to come, then you open that brown envelope and you have your prospectus. 
And so these brochures started arriving in the house. And she kept them in a bag. Um, and the bag got heavier and heavier by the day. More and more prospectuses came in. Um, and at some point, she says, she thinks it might have even been more than 10 kilos worth of, of, um, of brochures were in this bag. And she carried them around the house. She didn't say anything, but luckily, her parents loved her and her parents noticed this and, and they, um, they, um, they watched this bag getting larger and larger and being carried around the house. So they realised that she was really serious about studying abroad. And they made a deal with her that, you know, they would find a way to construct a budget that would allow her to pay for her fees, her accommodation and her minimum monthly expenses, you know, down to the last few pennies. Um, and um, she agreed. So they'd, you know, made a, a kind of, they'd made an agreement about a way forward. Now, at this stage, Rhea chose to focus on human resource management courses. And the reason she'd done that was because this had become a real area of interest during her undergraduate studies. So she was fortunate enough to be able to pursue a Master's of Science in Human Resource Management at the University of Manchester. Now, during this, she realised that at the end of her course, her opportunities in Greece were not going to be entirely satisfying because Greece is heavily dominated by SMEs, by small and medium-sized enterprises. The scope for a post in those enterprises, really doing that kind of analytical work that she wanted was quite limited. And it was also difficult for her to work in the UK because her master's course had not offered CIPD accreditation and that was one of the th key things that she would have needed to have worked within the UK. So she thought about her options once more, and she and she was inspired because her because her father was a professor of microbiology at the medical school of the University of Athens, and her brother had then been studying for a PhD um, in artificial intelligence at Imperial. He'd been able to get a scholarship, and so she decided this was the route for her but how to do it, how to do that. So she had yet another conversation with her parents and they worked out that, you know, there was a way so that she, she set a deal with them that, you know, um, they would help fund her fees um, and, um, you know, put into place the things that would allow her accommodation expenses if she could find a part-time job. Um, and so she agreed and she started her, um, her applications for PhD studies. Now, most universities, she says, rejected her PhD application. But, she, but you missed at the school, uh, the, in the School of Management there, did invite her for an interview. And during the interview, she got offered not only a place on the programme, she was offered a place as a, a part-time job as a seminar leader. And that, for her, unlocked this possibility of doing her PhD, because here was the job that she wanted. And so... She accepted, and as she says now, without understanding what a seminar leader was. So, in 2002, she joined the UMIS School of Management, um, now called the Manchester Business School, to study for a PhD in Management Sciences. And um, during that PhD then, she taught undergraduate seminars and she was involved in funded research projects as a research as assistant. And it's during this period that she discovered her passion, her passion for teaching. So on this journey, it took her to teaching, and she discovered her passion for it. So these experiences were extremely valuable, and they helped her secure her first full-time academic post, which was in 2006 at Middlesex University as a lecturer in human resource management. She progressed to seen to senior lecturer in 2008 and then she joined us here in at LSBU in 2016 as an associate professor of human resource management and she was promoted to professor in 2022. So the journey was not easy and it's something she's going to tell us more about in her speech. 
So throughout her academic journey, Rhea has become passionate about issues related to employee voice, working conditions, and the quality of working life. She's focused her research work on studying these topics in a variety of contexts, such as in emerging economies, transition economies, and crisis, e crisis economies, and in a variety of organisational settings, so such as small and medium-sized enterprises uh, and project-based organisations, and across different types of workers, such as traditional employees, temporary employees, e-lancers, gig or platform workers. During her academic career spanning over the last 20 years, Rhea has taught thousands of students, has supervised hundreds of undergraduate and, post and, post and postgraduate students in their projects and dissertations, and has supervised PhD students to completion. She has been program leader, director of undergraduate programs, head of division, research group lead, director of research and enterprise, and now associate dean for research and enterprise, among her other academic management roles. She's held external examining posts at the University of Bedfordshire, University of Greenwich, University of Hull, and Birmingham City University. She's received senior fellowship of the HEA, academic membership of CIPD, and membership of a wide range of other academic communities. She's been part of a collaborative European Commission, that's an Erasmus Plus programme, uh, part of a project on developing the cross-cultural skills of graduates in response to the need of European enterprise. And she has published numerous journal articles, books, textbooks, book chapters, and other outputs. Most notably, she won the 2019 Best Paper of the, of the Year Award um, by the European Management Review Journal for a paper entitled The Impact of Global Economic Crisis and Austerity on the Quality of Working Life and Work-Life Balance, a Capabilities Perspective. And then again, in 2020, she won the Benedictine University Award for Outstanding Paper on Ethical Issues in Consulting. Um, and this was from the Academy of, of the Academy of Management Conference um, for the paper, Can We Trust Them Again? A Framework for Repairing Trust in SMEs in an Economic Crisis Context. Rhea has peer-reviewed more than 150, 150 academic papers. You know, this is the most um, invisible task that we do. Um, and um, she was appointed a member of the British Academy of Management Peer Review College in 2022 and won the 2022 Best Reviewer Award from the British Academy of Management Conference, the um, Human Resource Management Special Interest Group, so the Best, the best Reviewer Award. Rhea is currently on the editorial board of um, Work, Employment and Society. Um, she's on the, on the editorial advisory board of the Employees Relations Journal, and she's the lead guest editor for a special issue in Human Resource Management Journal on conceptualising the nexus between macro-level turbulence and the worker experience in human resource management. And that's due for publication in 2023. Um, she has established the Voice Research Group, which is a virtual research group of academics with a common interest in all issues surrounding voice in the workplace. And Ria has been part of the independent review panel led by Nazir Afsal OBE, that reviewed London Fire Brigade's culture, the outcome of which has received significant media attention, in fact, in the last few weeks. And most recently, Rhea was appointed a member of um, UKRI's uh, Talent Peer <coughs> Review College. So that takes me to tonight. Special guests, colleagues, please welcome Pr Professor Rhea Prisca with her inaugural lecture entitled Voice and Silence in Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises, The Employee Experience.
Thank you, Deputy Vice Chancellor, for this introduction. Distinguished guests and colleagues, thank you also for being here today. Today, we celebrate not only the academic achievements, but also the academic journey. And for me personally, the journey is more important than the achievements. <sighs> because for me, it is not what we achieve that matters, but rather it is the obstacles we overcome that give value to the achievements. As you've heard in this introduction, I finished my PhD in 2006, and my topic was actually on outsourcing HR activities in Greece. Yet, if you look into my Google Scholar profile, you will see that I published my first paper in 2014 in the Journal of Change Management, and the topic was creating positive employee change evaluation. And yet, I'm standing here before you today to give a lecture on employee voice. So one surely wonders, how did I get here? So this is my journey. When I finished my PhD in 2006, I was offered the lectureship at Middlesex University, where I stayed for 10 years before I joined LSBU in 2016. And for the first three years in um, my employment at Middlesex, I did everything that an early career researcher does when they are offered the full-time academic position. I immersed myself into teaching, I tried to get to grips with academic management, and I also tried to publish for my thesis. But on the latter front, I was extremely naive, because I now know that you need six key elements to succeed in academic research. You need ideas, you need networks, you need the know-how, you need confidence, you need perseverance, and you need determination and I was lacking across all areas at the time. When I finished my PhD, my supervisor, to whom I will always be grateful for the support during my studies and for the work opportunities she offered when I was a student, she told me that she does not, st that, that, that she does not publish with her PhD students. So I was on my own, but I didn't give up. I started trying to publish papers from my thesis, and this is what I was doing for the first three years at Middlesex. I was writing papers, at least one paper, I was submitting to journals, I was waiting for months on end for the result, I was getting rejected, and then I was resubmitting. And each time I was getting a rejection, it brought me closer to the realization that publishing articles on my own was extremely hard and most likely impossible, but I kept going. Then. In 2009, I had my son in October of that year, and I took the maximum maternity leave that I could uh, take at full pay, which was about four or five months, and then I returned to work in 2010. When I returned, I was very conscious of the fact that publishing papers was not really working out for me. So I jumped at the opportunity to be part of an edited textbook that looked at critical issues in human resource management co-edited with my esteemed colleagues, Dr. Ian Roper and Dr. Yuracha Chatrakul, Naya Yudia, who are here with us today. And I published a chapter from my thesis in that textbook. Also, I pursued an edited book that would be giving an overview of business and management practices in Greece. I co-edited this with Dr. Maria Kapsali, a very close collaborator and, and friend of mine. When, so to, to get this book um, um, uh, uh, to get this book together, I contacted people that I knew from my PhD uh, studies, but also I cold contacted academics who were in the field and asked them to contribute chapters. And when Palgrave Macmillan agreed to commission the book, I was over the moon. This was a huge achievement for me, and I was very happy. And I remember how excited I was to share my news with two senior colleagues, male colleagues, over coffee on campus one day. And I also remember how one of them turned to the other one in front of me and said, people who can't publish do books. <laughs> and it did bother me, but I stayed on my path. By the way, this book was eventually nominated for the John Criticos Prize in 2011 
Now the prize is called the London Hellenic Prize and it is awarded to an original work inspired by Hellenic civilization, culture, history or literature. Once I completed these two projects, I went back into maternity leave. I had my daughter in December of uh, 2011. And again, I took the maximum leave that I could have at full pay, which was about four or five months, and I returned to work. Only when I returned in 2012, I returned to a different academia. Things were changing in higher education. The sector was facing funding cuts. There were high tuition fees that were introduced. There was competition between universities. Many had started to vigorously restructure. And there was more pressure on academics to not only deliver an excellent student experience, but also deliver on the research front. And especially post-1992 universities that had somewhat neglected, to some extent, research up until that point, realized the need to start investing in this area. And they started recruiting a lot of new staff, including many early career researchers that were publication ready. Noticing all these changes, and extremely conscious now of the fact that I hadn't published a single paper from my thesis, I went to see my then director of research to ask for advice. He asked me to bring him a copy of my thesis so that he could look at it and give me some ideas for papers. And so I did. I left the thesis with him. And after a week, I went to see him and asked whether he had had a chance to look at it. And this is what he said. Yes, I saw it, he said. Um, no. That was it. One word feedback and the feedback was no. <laughs> Obviously upset, I went straight to knock on another professor's door, Professor Susan Lewis. She was even more upset than me to hear about the feedback that I had just received. And she offered to help me herself. She gave me feedback on my PhD papers, but most importantly, she offered me some seed funding. I think it was about 500 pounds to start a new project. And this is what I did. I initiated a new project and I used the money to conduct some interviews in Greece on the issue of quality of working life of highly skilled professionals in times of financial crisis. You see, at that moment in time, Greece was experiencing an economic catastrophe that had started in 2009. We had bailouts after bailouts. There was a referendum at some point, salary reductions, increased taxes, layoffs, unemployment, demonstrations, strikes, anarchy. The banks were closed at some point. People were queuing in food banks. Parents were not able to feed their children. There, were, there was a lot of poverty and there was an increased rate in suicides. So within this context, I wanted to see how doctors, teachers, lawyers, and senior managers experienced this crisis. This paper, after several submissions to journals, eventually, four or five years of working on it, binning it, completely putting it in, in, in the bin, reviving it with a new team, starting from scratch from the analysis, and with a new team and further submissions, was eventually published in the European Management Review Journal in 2019. And not only was it published in this journal, but it also won the journal's Best Paper of the Year Award for 2019, and was selected to appear in the journal's virtual special issue on COVID-19, managing in times of crisis and great uncertainty in 2020. So back in 2012 now, let's go back to 2012, and I'm observing this catastrophe in Greece, and I'm also experiencing the pressures and uncertainties in the UK higher education sector. You see, I've always considered Greece to be my fallback position if things didn't work out in the UK. But now there was no going back. Thousands of young people in their 20s, in their 30s, were leaving Greece each year. They called it Greece's brain drain. An estimated half a million Greeks left during the financial crisis, uh, during which the economy shrunk by a quarter and unemployment skyrocketed to 28%. So this was it for me. I had to make this job work. But how could I if I couldn't publish? I did try networking with more people, but without a publication record, there were no many takers. Some said that they didn't have time, others did not respond, and even one male colleague told me that he avoided working with women in my situation, meaning with young children, because they held him, held him back in his work. And then another comment, and this time it was from a senior manager. The comment itself I will not repeat in this forum, 
I truly believe to this day that it was unintentional, albeit rude and personally hurtful. What I will say is that the union representative advised me at the time that I could take this comment as a direct threat to my employment. And although the person apologized shortly after, that comment had a profound effect on me because it pushed me from anxiety into despair. But most importantly, it woke me up. And when I woke up, I realized that there was a big storm coming my way. And not only was there no shelter in sight, but I didn't even have access to an umbrella. <laughs> and in that moment, I saw myself in the middle of nowhere. I looked right, I saw my children, there were one and three at the time. I looked left, I saw my husband with limited career advancement opportunities. I looked back and Greece was falling apart. And I need to move from this spot and I need to move fast. But how can I when I cannot publish? And this thought that had gradually developed in my mind over time was now haunting me. This was all I could think about. What will I do? I cannot publish. What will I do for days following this incident? And of course I lost my sleep. So I, I kept thinking about this. Until one night I was in bed, kept thinking, what will I do? What will I do? And all of a sudden I hear a voice in my mind and the voice is angry, beyond angry. It's actually furious by this point. And it asked me a very important question that I hadn't quite considered up until that point. And I started engaging in a conversation with myself that didn't last longer than 10 seconds. The voice asked, why can, can't you publish? And I wasn't sure how to answer this question. So the voice said again, okay, let's take a step back and think about this logically. Look around you and look at all the other people publishing. What do they have that you do not have? So I gave it a, a thought and I said, well, nothing in terms of an ability, but what they do have is that they have figured out the way to publish. And I said, that's it. It's not that I cannot publish. It is just that I have not yet figured out the way to publish. Publishing is a skill and skills you can learn. So I said, this is it. I will learn how to publish. I will do anything and everything in my power to publish. And I will not stop until I publish. I will get this done. And in that moment of resolution, I felt all of this anxiety and all of this despair being lifted. And for the first time in some days, I, I went to sleep in peace. These 10 seconds, defined my career path to this lecture hall tonight. And I will tell you what happened as a result. The next day I woke, up, I woke up and I picked up the phone and I did what every Greek person in the UK does when they are in a difficult situation. I called another Greek person in the UK. <laughs> I chose an academic, someone more experienced than me in publishing. His name was Alexandros Psychoyos. He was one of the academics I had called contacted for the edited book on Greece I did, I, I spoke about earlier, the book that the two senior colleagues mocked me for pursuing. I told Alexandros that I had time to write and asked whether he had any projects I could get involved in. I told him that I could do pretty much everything and anything on any HR topic except from quantitative analysis. And this was the start of a long-term collaboration and close collaboration. Through this collaboration and through initiating more and new collaborations, I gradually managed to build two research directions in my work around work relationships and working life. One that is looking at working conditions, employee voice, silence, employee uh, participation and representation and quality of working life, uh, looking at turbulent co context, looking at economies under crisis, under transition um, or emerging economies. And a second direction that looks at these issues in the non-traditional employment relationships to look at different forms of organizing and varying types of workers. Overall, I started in 2014 with zero articles, zero peer-reviewed articles, and I had none before that. And I reached the end of REF 2021 with 13 peer-reviewed articles, which included one ABS four star in a journal of distinction, one ABS four, six ABS three, and five ABS2 and one articles amongst other outputs. 
one of the first papers we published with Alexandros was this one. And it was a paper that was looking at how small companies can reward employees when there is a crisis in the economic context. It was a quantitative paper, and we looked at gathering data from southeastern Europe, and you can see the, the countries there. What was interesting here is that we found that in the, such uh, uh, economies, when there is great uncertainty, we found three elements of the working environment that could lead to increased performance. Work-life balance, employee involvement, voice mechanisms, and organizational culture. So what it meant in practice was that when um, there were limited HR budgets, uh, non-financial strategies such as these three ones that you see here can be a viable alternative. And this was the first time I was looking at voice in the findings that I was working at. I had not come across it beyond the kind of widely studying. So as we were working through this paper, I got the idea that I had to start focusing more my research on to employee voice. What had happened? I had called a good friend of mine in Greece to find out how she was, and this was at the height of the economic crisis. So there were a lot of layoffs, a lot of unemployment. So I asked how she was and her husband and whether their jobs were secure. She said she was fine, but she also said that her husband was not getting paid. What do you mean, I said? Did they not pay him the full salary this month? She said, no, no. I said, what do you mean? Have they not paid him at all this month? She said, Rhea, he hasn't been paid in six months. I said, what do you mean he hasn't been paid in six months? This was shocking. She goes to work every day as normal. She said, yes. He works 10, 12 hours in the workplace every day? Yes. And they haven't paid him anything in six months? She said, yes. I said, why does he not say anything? She said, what is there to say? Nobody else in the company is getting paid. So I said, why does he not leave? She said, there's nowhere to go. There's so much unemployment. And at least if he's patient and he sticks around, eventually, maybe if the situation stabilizes, he might be able to get some of this money back. So this was it. This was a very important issue faced by a great portion of Greeks at the time. You had employees not being paid for months on end, and yet they don't complain and yet they don't leave. How is that even possible? So let's have a look at what voice is. Voice has been studied from a variety of theoretical perspectives, HRM, organizational behavior, industrial relations, psychology, political science, economics, and law. And this is why when you read the literature on employee voice, you find various uh, terminologies being used, such as participation, engagement, empowerment, or involvement. In my own research, I have mainly used the HRM viewpoint or the organizational behavior viewpoint, or I have combined both approaches. The first approach is looking and placing the individual at the center, and um, it is all about the individual being able to express dissatisfaction or complaint over something that concerns uh, them to management. Um, the organizational behavior viewpoint argues that voice is discretionary. It is a pro-social behavior and the main beneficiary is the organization. And of course, you know, we, we can argue for both perspectives, and that's why there have been calls um, in recent years to start combining perspective, perspectives, because one perspective does not exclude the other. So there are many, many great benefits for businesses for enabling voice in the workplace, and you can see some of them here. Uh, beyond the standard profitability, productivity, creativity, efficiency that you, we can always expect with, with great HR practices. There are some practical aspects here in terms of cost reduction. Uh, when people are happier, they stay in the workplace, uh, the staff retention improves. Um, there are less absences, the communication improves. Um, and also, you can resolve issues much faster. So if you have a trade union in place, you don't have to escalate issues. Um, but you can resolve them quite quickly. But there is also a moral case for enabling voice in the workplace. It is the right thing to do, and it is linked with uh, many dimensions of good work. It leads to happiness and well-being, and there is a range of outcomes when, it, when you have employees that are happy 
and that, that are feeling um, uh, well in the workplace. Um, not only the productivity and the motivation increases, but the physical and the mental health also improves. So you have reduced stress, depression, anxiety, and burnout. And voice can be direct between employees and managers or indirect through collective or representative means. I have mainly focused on direct uh, voice and I have looked at both formal and informal voice mechanisms. You could have structures in the workplace that enable voice and you can also have um, uh, an organization that does not have any explicit mechanisms but um, you still enable voice to reach you in different ways such as through informal discussions and meetings or open door practices. So now that we have a quick understanding of what voice is, we can talk about employee silence because it is the opposite. And it is when people are reluctant to speak up about organizational issues or to share ideas aimed at benefiting the organization. And it could be that they're making a conscious choice not to speak up, or it could be that you might have institutional structures in place or management structures in place that organize workers outside of the voice process. And I don't have to say anything about the case against employee silence because we've looked at the benefits of voice. So it's quite obvious that if you do not offer um, avenues for voice, and the outcome would be silence, you would miss out on the great benefits we have just discussed. When you look into the literature, you can try to, and try to see the reasons for which people remain silent. You can come across typologies, okay? Different types of groupings, types of silence, and there are lots of different um, um, terms being used here, but we can categorize them according to the cause. And sometimes people remain silent because they are in a group and they feel the pressure to be part of the group and conform. Sometimes people might uh, decide to remain silent because maybe the situation, if they wait, if they are patient, it will change. So they don't need to speak out now. Yeah, maybe they have hope. Maybe sometimes um, they want to be seen as a good citizen, organizational citizen, many times because they are afraid. And it could be that there is a widespread, uh, widespread culture of fear in an organization that makes people feel that voice is futile or even dangerous. Or it could be that it's, it's an, in, at an individual level, fear at an individual level, and uncertain how to react, how do you um, um, interact with your, with your manager. Or they could be afraid that they might harm a relationship. So different types of, of causes. So as we were, I was looking into the literature and discussing with Alexandros at the time um, and looking at what was going on in, in Greece, we have identified or had identified at that point that there was a gap in this voice and silence literature with respect to how the macro context affects voice and silence. We have all these typologies and they explain lots of reasons, but we couldn't see where the context fits into all of this. And of course, at that point, we were dealing with an economic crisis, and that was what was on, on our minds. So why should we study uh, voice and silence during an economic crisis? Because of all these things that happen when you are in an economic crisis. And a lot of these things are happening now, post-COVID. Um, uh, it's, it's another type of an economic crisis uh, we are faced. People are afraid that they might lose their job. Um, there may be redundancies, layoffs. Um, so whoever stays back, the workload increases. There is a lot more pressure. There is a lot of tension in relationships at work, including bullying. You might have hierarchical decision-making and authoritarian abusive or abusive leadership styles. So the overall negative impact uh, falls on health and, and, and mental health, physical and mental health. So it's quite interesting to look into this context. It's also quite interesting to look at this context in, in relation to SMEs. So why should we study voice and silence in smaller firms particularly? You see, in smaller firms, usually, of course, the SME category captures a lot of different um, organizational sizes, but it captures um, anything from 10 employees to 250. And we know that as the size increases, there is a greater likelihood that there's gonna be an HR function in place. But even then, it's not as developed as in other types of organizations. 
And what happens is, of course, they need to deliver HR activities. You always need to hire, fire, do performance appraisals, and, and, and so on. So usually, all of these activities fall on the line managers. And they don't have formal voice structure, so the line manager becomes pivotal. And when you are in a crisis, you have small firms, they are already vulnerable. So when there is a drastic drop in the demand for goods and services, of course, the cash flow um, um, is affected. Um, smaller firms don't easily have the same access to finance as other firms, so they react with cost reduction strategies. For example, they restructure, they downsize, they uh, implement pay cuts, they might implement recruitment freezes, they might cut the training and development budget. So there is overall this situation happening. So within this context, we conducted two studies. This was uh, studies conducted around um, 2012, 13, 14, 15, that, that, uh, that uh, period. And we conducted two studies. One was a follow-up of the previous one. One was looking at the issue of voice from the employee perspective. And the other one was looking at the issue from the line manager's perspective. And for each of these, we interviewed employees and managers at two different points in time, because we wanted to see not only how employees and line managers experience the macro context in one particular point in time, but we wanted to see how their kind of perceptions might have changed over time. So the first paper was looking at how employees that work in small companies perceive the effects of the recent crisis on their ability to freely express concerns to management. And the second one was looking at how line managers that work in small businesses perceive the impact of the recent economic crisis in the way that they manage their own teams, as well as in their own ability to express voice higher up. And line managers are a very interesting category to study because they are in between. They are employees. Yeah, they are employees, but they are sitting in between. They have a team to manage, and then they report to somebody higher, higher up. And this is what we found. We mapped out the different uh, silence typologies, and we found that people were silent uh, because they were afraid of the consequences. So such consequences were being labeled a troublemaker, being afraid of negative performance rankings, and feeling afraid of damaging the relationship with their manager. And in the long term, because we did this study in two phases, it was a more, um, the fear had escalated to a fear of retaliation. There were a lot of reports of salary withholding, salary reductions, redundancies, or even dismissal. People were afraid that they might lose their job if they said something. So we, 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 uh, we saw this climate of silence that the literature discusses. We also found that they responded in relation to how um, they perceived how long or how long they perceived the crisis to last. So in the beginning, they were more accommodating. At the beginning of the economic crisis, nobody knew how, how much, you know, how long it would last. So they were more keen to support the organizations. They were demonstrating cooperative, uh, perhaps, behaviors. Um, but in the long term, they realized that speaking up might not make a difference. So uh, we have different types of silence there. Importantly, we found a different type of, of typology that we argued in the paper. People were silent because they thought it was the norm. And we argued for social empathy silence to be a mimetic type of emotional or behavioral reaction where people, people were um, interacting with people at work, um, interacting with their social cycles, including their families and friends, and they were also greatly influenced by the media, who was constantly bombarding um, everyone with so stories about the economic crisis. So there was this climate that I am afraid because everyone is afraid. How can I not be afraid? I'm silent because nobody's speaking up. Of course I'm going to be silent, you know? Um, and this was what we, uh, our main contribution in that paper. In the, the follow-up study, we looked at the line manager's perspective. And again here, we found in two phases that um, at the beginning, similarly, line managers were, were much more cooperative and they were much more hopeful. But in the second phase uh, of our data collection, 
um, they were more disengaged and they started becoming cynical. They did not really trust whether what the owner was telling them was actually happening. So at some point, after a year, two years, three years, four years of crisis, you're thinking, could it be that they're taking advantage of this? Is it really that bad? Could it be that there's really nothing we can do and we need to cut the salaries and we need to work harder and we need to stay unpaid? So we had what we called cynical silence in, the, in this paper. And it develops over time because lack of trust accumulates over time as well. So what was interesting here to rem and for us to remember is that line managers, because of their unique role, sitting in between of hierarchies and being responsible for their own team, but also reporting to somebody higher up, they could, or the, what we found was they, that they were inhibited in the role um, uh, and not always enabling a uh, voice within the, the, their teams, but also they were not always sharing with, with, with owners. And as we sort of were finishing these two studies and through the interviews we collected and a lot of people were talking about supporting each other and the um, concept of solidarity was uh, starting to be mentioned, we wanted to do another study. And we wanted to do another study that would be looking at solidarity in the workplace. And we looked at solidarity as helpful behaviors in the workplace between coworkers. Solidarity in the literature, when you look and, and read about it, you can study vertical solidarity, so how employees support managers, but you can also study horizontal solidarity, which is how employees support coworkers and each other. And we wanted to focus on this, uh, the, this the second one. And we wanted to also decided to look at top-down employee communications because in times of crisis, usually, the literature talks about the importance of messaging from the top to the bottom about what is going on. So we wanted to see whether there is any link in between of top-down employee communication because it's such a fundamental HR practice, yet it is a practice that is treated as, as the lowest step in the escalator of participation that Mick Marchington talked about because it's a one-way process, it's top-down, so how could it lead to anything more if it's top-down? But we found the opposite. We found that employee communication, which is top-down communication, and specifically communicating around task, what explaining to employees what needed to be done, but also giving them feedback about their performance, we found that not only is it an uh, instrumental HR practice that leads to voice, but it can also lead to horizontal solidarity. That was very interesting. Then we moved on away with other colleagues as well from crisis. Of course, I've done other, other, other pieces of work, but I'm only selecting uh, some to present <coughs> today. We moved away from the crisis, but learned a lot from it and looking and focusing on the, on, on the economic crisis. And we wanted to, to move a step beyond and look at the macro context and in general and look at beyond the economy political, social, cultural factors that might be influencing voice in SMEs. So we went into, with colleagues here at LSBU um, and Chris Brewster as well from Reading University, uh, we decided to look at what determines voice in small and medium enterprises. And a couple of years before we started working on this, there was a, a paper published by uh, Bruce Kaufman, and Bruce Kaufman had published an employment relations model on employee voice determinants. And there were other frameworks, but it was more comprehensive, this one, because it put everything into perspective. Um, and most importantly, he argued that um, we shouldn't only be looking at psychological explanations as to why people might remain silent in the workplace, but uh, that we should also pay attention to institutional, human resource management, industrial relations, and employment relations contexts. And this is what we wanted to do. So with uh, colleagues here, we did um, a study. We've published two papers out of this study. And um, we've, looked at, um, we've looked at the uh, voice determinants in smaller firms. And we did an international study, comparative study, a qualitative one. We focused on the UK, Thailand, and Nigeria because they're so different and because they have so many different institutions and economic and um, socio-political uh, factors. And in the first, for the first paper here, 
we looked at what are the macro level context, the institutional, the socioeconomic, the cultural, uh, how does it interplay with the organizational configuration and the governance structure, and then how does that also interplay with the micro level context. And for the second one, we looked at the influence of culture because one of our key findings or important findings from the first paper was uh, the importance of culture because we looked at uh, this issue internationally. Um, and on the second paper, we looked at how, what relationship culture has in, the, in relation to affecting organizational norms and signals and how those impact on norms and on employee voice behaviors. But I'm gonna present the framework that we published in the first paper because it's more um, uh, holistic, if you like. And I think this is an interesting framework for, especially if we have any business owners here or uh, colleagues that work uh, in businesses, because it maps out not only what influences voice and silence, but we take it a step further from Kaufman and we contextualize it within the small business firm. So we do have the external environment, and we do have institutions, and we have socioeconomic and cultural factors there. But what is interesting about the governance structure of smaller firms is that the CEO has a lot of power, and it depends on the firm, but there is a role and there is a power that we need to pay attention uh, for, for the CEO. And of course, that would influence the leadership style. Is it a command control style, or is the leadership style more supportive? And then in smaller firms, you usually have flat structures, but you could have hierarchical structures because you know, uh, they, uh, they depend upon the size, as we have talked about. And um, that would influence where HRM sits. Is there an HRM function in place? Is there a specialist around? What role do they have? Is it operational or strategic? And do they have formalized HR pro uh, practices? And that would also influence, therefore, whether there is a voice system in place that is formalized or informalized, what the purpose of voice channels may be, and what the culture is in the organization. And then on the, on the top side, let's not forget that we have employees and employers interacting with, with one another. So employees have their own background and uh, demographics. It depends on how, how many years they've been in an organization. It depends on their employment contract. And also, they interact with employers, so the culture, the leadership, and management is important. So we present all these factors together, and depending on where an SME sits within this framework, either there is strong agency, people are enabled to speak up, or there is weak agency, um, because they would have different perceived levels of voice, and therefore the behavior of employees um, will also be affected, not only how they speak up, but also what they say and how frequently they, they do this as well. So if I can summarize, and I just wanted to present you know, some key findings from, thank you, some key findings from um, these studies that uh, I have presented. Um, for, small company leaders. We cannot deny that there is a macro level context and that it influences the employee experience. And this is not just the economic crisis that we studied back in 2009, 10, 12. This is ongoing and it's in international, uh, at an international level, um, political, economic, we have COVID, it's happening here in the UK as well. But what we can note is that the experiences of employees are different because people have individual reasons for staying silent or speaking up in the workplace. And also, most importantly and interestingly, is that we need to remember that the levels of voice and or silence can fluctuate. So it's not enough to just do a study in your firm to see whether people are happy or not happy with the, with the cost of living crisis, but you should rather monitor to see how these perceptions might be changing, what might be causing silence, um, and then how you can you address it. In smaller firms, because we have this lack of HR specialism and or formal channel, channels, the role of the owner and of the line manager become pivotal because it is up to them to create a voice positive culture in the organization. But we need to remember that line managers, especially when there is uncertainty, they may be become 
um, inhibited in enabling voice in their workplace. And not only with their teams, like uh, silencing their own teams, but also how they communicate to owners higher up. So leadership style matters. And finally here as well, that when in crisis, top-down employee communication that we have so long thought that it was not, uh, could not bring great benefits, we found that when there is a crisis context, it might not only lead to voice, but it can also lead to solidarity between um, co-workers. So this was a, a summary of, of some uh, research insights that I would like to present today. And I want to say that beyond voice in SMEs, I have embarked on a variety of different uh, projects because they are, it's equally important to progress the field beyond uh, what has been studied. And a key area that I'm focusing on is looking at macro level turbulence and the worker experience. We are now co-editing a special issue in Human Resource Management Journal with colleagues that are in this room today. Um, and it will be published in 2023. So I, I will be glad to share this with you. And this is looking at different types of crisis because we have many and they're happening at the same time. They are happening all over the world and they are affecting the world of, 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 of work. Secondly, we need to move away from the idea of thinking about employees to thinking about workers because we have so many different employment relationships these days. We have freelancers, e-lancers, we have gig platform economy. So we need to look at voice in this type of non-traditional employment. I'm also working on remote working post COVID and how that has affected the voice channels that uh, the literature has discussed about and also how we can utilize voice mechanisms to create inclusive organizations. So um, with many colleagues here, I'm also working to look at the intersection in between of gender, age, disability, ethnicity, and so on, as to in relation to how people experience voice. And of course, lately, with my involvement in the London Fire Brigade, the review on London's Fire Brigade culture, I think it's quite interesting to look at public sectors as well because they have different types of HRM configurations um, and voice might become a, a particular issue in this type of critical services. So currently, with a lot of many colleagues who are here, uh, about, and I think it's about 20 of us, we keep growing, we have established a virtual research group and uh, the point of this research group is to bring together academics who have a common interest in all issues surrounding voice and we want to engage. We want to engage with businesses, with managers, with HR practitioners, and when, with anyone who is interested in our research and our, our, our future research agenda as well. We offer resources, summaries of our research findings, practical points, and you can access the papers there as well. And if anybody's here today, we, can, we offer consultancy, we offer knowledge uh, exchange opportunities as well. So do come and speak to me at the end. So we are reaching the end of this lecture. And what can I say? 10 seconds of internal reflection have brought me before you today. In fact, these 10 seconds were so par powerful that I still use them today as my anchor. Every time I doubt myself, every time I need to remember where I was, every time I need to remember where I am, every time I need to plan about where I'm going to go next. Most recently, these 10 seconds enabled me to apply for this promotion to professor. I had attended the workshop provided here at LSBU in autumn 2021. It was a workshop on promotions and it was targeted at female academics. And there was this female professor that shared her journey with us and she was saying how she didn't think that her achievements were enough and how another senior colleague prompted her and gave her confidence to go for it. And as I was listening to her talk, I went back to these 10 seconds and I all of a sudden jumped from my chair. I opened my eyes wide and I said, could it be that whatever was holding me back, back then, is now happening again? And in that moment, I decided to go for it. In fact, I had downloaded the application to, for promotion even before the workshop had finished and I had started working on it. So many people have been part of my journey, of course, and I would definitely like to thank uh, organizations that have participated, all these organizations that have participated in the studies, because without 
um, data, you cannot do a lot of work in research. And of course, the thousands of students, I've taught thousands of students, and my PhD students, some are here today. You have inspired me to keep going. My parents, they have supported me greatly, my family and my friends uh, throughout um, everything uh, that has to do with this journey, but also beyond. And of course, my close collaborators, many of whom are now very precious friends. You have openly shared your ideas with me. You have helped me grow my network. You have helped me develop my research know-how. You have unconditionally given me confidence when I was in doubt. And you have inspired me to persevere. I wasn't sure whether I should say this next part, but I will, because I only get to be on this stage once. <laughs> I would also like to sincerely thank those who didn't support me, <laughs> intentionally or unintentionally, through their words or their actions. They have been an undeniable part of this journey. They have fueled my determination. And for this, I will be eternally grateful. <laughs> and to my colleagues who may be finding academia hard, this is my message to you. You are not alone. And to anyone in a position of power, formal or informal power, in academia or beyond, let's remember that what we say and how we act can profoundly impact on someone's experience with work. So we should bring encouragement, kindness, compassion, consideration, and helpfulness at the center of our practice. I leave you all tonight with my personal motto, it is possible, find a way, and make it happen. Thank you.